Uh, so I assume everyone can hear me fine. Um, if anyone wants to move a bit closer to the front, feel free. We've got loads of space. Uh, might be a bit easier for me to hear if there's any questions. Um, so yeah, this talk, automating myself out of a job. Um, I hope the apostrophe is in the right place. I, I, think, that's, I think that's right. Uh, I'm a pen tester. Um, we're going to be talking about left shifting and security testing. Um, some contact details uh, down the bottom if you want to try and reach me. OK, so who can relate to this kind of thing, right? Um, security, even security guys see themselves as, as the bad guys, unfortunately. Uh, we, we know that security hasn't kept up with kind of modern development practices. Uh, this is, is something that we are aware of, and you know, we want to try and address that. Um, to even today, we've, we've heard people talking about security and how security needs to do better. Uh, and, and I 100% agree with that. Um, so just from show of hands, can I see kind of who fits in which place? So who's a developer in this room? OK, cool. Well, what about like project manager? Awesome. Um, QA testers, UIT testers? OK, a few. Uh, and then like DevOps. OK, yeah, I mean, obviously, that makes sense, right? Um, and the question was asked earlier, but who, who's in security, like only security? OK, a, a few people. OK, awesome. Um, yeah, that just kind of helps me understand kind of how to, uh, you know, how to, to uh, what kind of language to use in the talk. Um, so why did I want to do this, uh, this talk? Well, I do really believe that pen testing is of quite limited value to a lot of organizations. Um, we still have vulnerable software, right? So, I mean, the Equifax thing uh, happened recently. I had to talk about it. Um, security testing isn't finding as many issues as, as it could. Uh, in the UK, we have an ISP called TalkTalk. Talk. Um, again, quite a similar thing happened. Lots of data was, uh, was, was stolen. Um, and it was via something quite simple, you know, like a SQL injection vulnerability, I think it was. You know, probably just some, some kid with SQL map or similar uh, finding what should be a well understood uh, issue. Um, so, yeah, pen testing, it, it can be of limited value. Uh, this talk isn't really going to be about use these tools and be secure. Um, we'll be looking more about some concepts. Uh, to be honest, I'm sure that you guys probably know a bit more about the tools than, than I do. Um, I'm not a DevOps person. Uh, I am a pen tester. I'm a security consultant. But I do feel that you know, it, it does take uh, effort from the InfoSec community to, to help shift left uh, testing. Um, so yes, these are some of the things I, I hear about pen testing. So even pen testers say that pen testing sucks. Um, I hear a lot of people saying, it's quite boring to test a lot of the applications. You know, once you've tested a, a few web applications, you've seen kind of most, the, most things you're going to see. Uh, we have to report low-risk issues. Um, a lot of people we speak to think that we're padding the report like this. Uh, no, the truth is, if we've identified it as a risk, we need to report it. Uh, and we know no one fixes the issues. I mean, that's actually kind of demoralizing. You know, we spend a lot of time and effort doing a pen test and writing a report. Uh, we know that people aren't going to fix it. If we're doing a test where there are loads of issues, especially loads of low-risk issues, we know that the security wasn't considered during development. Uh, therefore, no one's going to fix the issues we find. Um, th then these are the kind of things that you know, developers tend to say. Uh, again, padding the report uh, with low-risk issues. Uh, we don't understand the, the context of the vulnerability, so we kind of rate them uh, in a way that doesn't always make sense. A uh, lot of ego in, in pen tests. I don't know if anyone agrees. Has anyone had to deal with pen testers before? Yeah, man, we, we think we're the greatest thing, right? Um, you know, we roll in and, and we, we're probably on site for a week or two, uh, hand a report thinking that we've kind of hacked something awesome and leave and, okay, yeah. Not, we're not too easy to talk to. Um, and then, of course, we're, we're stopping development. You know, people want to be able to release applications uh, quickly. Um, and then the pen tester comes along and says, actually, we have these issues, um, which actually kind of, you know, that stops development. Uh, the release should really come first, right? Well, uh, that, that seems to be the most important thing, actually having a product out there. So yeah, who am I? Uh, my name's uh, Jamel Harris. Most people call me Jay. That's fine. 
uh, pen test, the security researcher at Digital Interruption. Um, I'm quite interested in mobile security, um, radio and reverse engineering, and some Twitter handles there. Uh, I run a group uh, in the UK, Manchester Grey Hats. Feel free to, to join uh, our Twitter thing because we're going to start recording um, the, the workshops. We give security workshops. We run CTFs as well, and we join in CTFs. I know CTFs were mentioned earlier. If that's something you're interested in, feel free to join our group. Uh, we have a Slack channel as well. Um, that's, that's it about me. Uh, so just to define quickly what I mean by pen testing, um, even us in the industry don't always agree on terms, which can be quite confusing. Really, I'm going to just I'm going to use pen testing to mean kind of all security testing. Any questions? Okay, cool. So, traditional development. I mean, you've all seen this kind of thing, right? This waterfall methodology: uh, gather requirements, design, implement, test, deploy. Uh, you know, quite an old way of doing things. I'm going to say if you work like this. Pen testing as it is probably works fine. You have other things you probably need to start fixing first. Um, pen testing in this way, you know, is, is going to still be fairly expensive, but yeah, you can make you can save a lot more money by fixing other things. Pen testing in this way works fine. Many organisations are trying to move to a more agile approach, um, where you know, uh, test um, development is is happens in quite short bursts of time. I've tried to pen test in this kind of uh, environment before, and it's really difficult. I was on a project, um, and they tried to, they wanted to release every, uh, I think, two weeks. This project lasted for uh, a couple of years. And I mean, how, how do you pen test that thing when, it, when the product isn't even developed, when new features were constantly coming in? A lot of it, a lot of what we did was, was code review, um, which, you know, whilst being useful, was not the best use of our use of our time, but yeah, that's how we uh, that's how we were able to do some amount of security testing in an agile environment. What we have now doesn't quite work. And then obviously, you know, we're trying to move to um, continuous integration and continuous delivery. There were talks earlier that kind of described this better than I can, you know. But the idea being that we want to constantly, uh, you know, deploy. We want to automate our test, automate our deployment. And you know, in this kind of thing, you know, where does security testing fit in? So looking back um, a bit more of a traditional thing, uh, this this tends to be what well, this tends to be what happens. Uh, security testing isn't prioritised until it is. Uh, we do have testing in this thing, but you know, security testing is often done by a different team, um, maybe from an external uh, company, and it's it's not really thought about until someone says to you, you need to get a pen test. Uh, then everyone panics, brings in a pen test company, they do the test, they're left with the results. Uh, from the pen tester's point of view, we turn up, wait for some requirements, we do some testing, wait for some more requirements, do some testing, um, we, we leave, write a report, and then that's it. And after that, we're kind of done, um, which isn't, again, super useful. Uh, I see developers often feeling like this when we, after we've left. Um, again, dealing with our ego, I was on site with, with one of my colleagues, um, a really experienced hacker, and actually, you know, he's probably one of the best in the UK. Uh, we were on site, we were doing some testing, and he was reading through some source code and saw, uh, saw a vulnerability and started laughing. Uh, the developer who wrote it was sitting right behind us. So how do you think he feels when he has this, you know, quite young guy on site who's, who's mocking him for some code he's written? Um, Often, as I said before, the report is going to be full of low-risk issues, uh, and then a couple of maybe medium or higher that should hopefully uh, be fixed. So organizations, just throwing money away, honestly. Um, the pen testers, great time. So what we're going to do in this talk, we're going to look at an application. Um, we're going to look at some of the vulnerabilities I found whilst testing this application, and we're going to see if we can figure out ways um, to automate some of that testing so that we could have found the issues before the pen tester came in. So this app um, is an Android and iOS app and it was used to make VoIP calls. So again, this is a real application. Um, there was the clients and then the web service. Uh, when we did the pen test, it was from multiple perspectives. So 
from a lost device? You know, what can an attacker do if they found the device? What if malware was installed on the, on, on the phone? Um, and then, of course, attacking the, the server. So I tend to do most of my mobile apps from, from these kind of three viewpoints. So these are the vulnerabilities, uh, the high vulnerabilities that we found. Uh, this is just a subset, obviously, of the issues. Um, so the mobile verification code could be brute force. So this was a code, you know, got tech, uh, sent to um, like by email or, or to a phone number. Um, you use that when you want to register. You could brute force this. You could view other users' messages um, without obviously logging in. SSL validation was disabled, so you could intercept the network traffic quite easily. And then there was directory traversal on the web service. We have some medium issues. Uh, now, just kind of show of hands, or I mean, who kind of agrees that all these things should be medium? I mean, there's that backups allowed in the Android app, right? Um, you might say that that's not even an issue. Well, the thing is, this allowed us to access some sensitive data that was in the application sandbox. So, you know, we raised it as a medium issue. Um, yeah, lack of permissions on the Android uh, IPC endpoints, SQL injection. Um, you know, kind of medium because you needed to have some malware on the device, which kind of changes the risk. And then some, some low issues, uh, so logging, um, anti-debugging, lack of root detection. Now, some people, again, wouldn't kind of classify these as, as vulnerabilities. But there is some amount of risk there. You know, it's not just us padding the report. It, it, it does amount to some risk in the app. So let's see how we can try and integrate security. Um, but first, you know, if you had the report, this, this report, this was your app, who would go live knowing those issues were there? No one. Oh, maybe one person. OK, interesting. So are you saying that no one, everyone would just not go live with the issues? Okay, super interesting. Um, so they obviously just went live. <laughs> they, uh, I guess they plan to fix it in the future. I'm not sure if they have. So the, the solution, um, we can't ignore security, obviously. Um, but we need to put the security in the hands of, of the developers. We need to left shift it. We need to make it so that testing is done earlier. Not only is it cheaper, but there will be new ways of testing applications. Um, developers are good at testing their code. You know, they have things like unit tests. That's not going to be a way that I, as a pen tester, test an application. So the first stage, requirements gathering. Um, we want developers uh, and project managers to think like an attacker. There is going to be multiple ways of doing this. You can use threat modeling, you know, try and understand uh, the application, decompose it, determine the, the, uh, the, the threats. Um, Determine the countermeasures and mitigations. Document this. Think of the assets that an attacker is trying to get to. Often, we're not after a shell on the, service, uh, on the server. We're after an, a specific asset. Think about how an attacker might be able to access that. Look at previous pen test reports. If a pen test has happened, use that to understand the risk of your application. Um, and if you need to bring in someone external to, uh, to help you understand uh, the risk of your application, this is a good time to do it, not at the end when the development has already happened. Um, different applications will have different risk, risk ratings. An internal brochureware application, you know, who, who really cares? Uh, if it's not secure, it's not the end of the world. Um, but if it's, say, like a fintech application, a payments application, this is actually going to be fair, like have a high risk profile. So these are the ones where you really need to think about um, understanding the, uh, the, re the security requirements before the app is developed. So take another wipe application. Um, think about some of the attacks. So let's say we want to try and uh, brute force uh, the username and password. Um, so here we have a list of, of basic requirements that, uh, that we've, de we've decided before the app even started to be developed. Uh, we know that if these things if these requirements are part of the application, then we can say that the application is going to be secure, or at least in line with the risk profile that we've decided our application has. Uh, so this, this last one, again, some people don't really like that. The application shouldn't run on a rooted device. Um, but we may decide, you know, this is a, a very uh, highly, um, uh, you know, this is an application with a quite a high risk profile. We don't want it to run on rooted devices, because an attacker might be able to 
uh, steal money, malware can do bigger things. So maybe we actually decide this is the case. So I, I don't often see something like this, but abuse stories. So in Scrum, you have the idea of, uh, of user stories, right? I, I assume everyone's kind of familiar with those. I don't often see people thinking about them from an attacker's point of view. So abuse stories. As an attacker, I want to log into the application without knowing the password. Uh, as an attacker, I want to read files in the application sandbox. You know, think about these, document these abuse stories. These might even be split even further. So as an attacker, I want to log into the mobile ap application without knowing the password by brute forcing, launching the activity manually on Android, SQL injection. Honestly, there could be a, any number of ways, but the more you document, the, uh, the better idea you're going to have about the types of attacks that um, your application may be vulnerable to. Maybe actually document these in a diagram. Um, and again, the point is to try and understand these before the application is even developed. So if there's any questions, by the way, feel free to just shout them out. Okay, cool. Um, so really it helps us to, to find and address some, some design issues. I, I really love this, uh, this GIF. Because I, I mean, this is kind of how pen tests feel sometimes. They're just, there are design issues that should have been found early on. And I think if people were just taking the time to document the types of um, threats to their applications, they would have, they, this would have happened, they would have found it. I like to think of the difference between you know, a house and a prison. Uh, if you want to turn a house into a prison, it's actually kind of difficult, right? You've built a house, has all these weaknesses, uh, but the prison was created to be secure. Okay, so. Project management, no, requirements gathering. Okay, we can think about security there. Um, if we do, we, we could probably even say, okay, we're done, we're done. We've understood everything, um, but you know, we actually need to implement some of those, those uh, requirements. So how do we embed security knowledge into the development teams, which I think is kind of one of the most important steps. Training, obviously a big one. Um, there are lots of training courses and, and things now that are kind of gamified, they allow developers to, uh, to, to learn about security through some game, they have achievements and whatever, you know, that's much better than bringing someone in to speak to them in the classroom uh, or just kind of one of, some of those super lame, um, you know, CBT video type things. Uh, pairing, you know, if you work in a development team and you're actually working together, uh, you can actually check each other's code as you're checking in, look for security issues, do code reviews. If you have a security SME um, in the team, you know, speak to them. Ask if you have a question about security. Ask them about it. See if they can actually give you a response. You know, I, I need to use this technology. What kind of things do I need to keep in mind? Uh, I mean, the security champion, quite a similar thing. But uh, so the reason I have this in is because I've been working in, in, in organizations before where there have been people that are super interested in security. Um, and then they've left their development team to become you know, pen testers or, or something else, which seems ridiculous. They have an interest in security. They're uh, in the development team. Why not let, allow them to become the security champion for the team? Uh, security code reviews and then chat ops. So you know, I, I worked at a place once where um, the, uh, it was an internal pen test team. No one on the team was uh, on the Slack uh, group um, for the company. I was like, why not, guys? This is. Uh, I answered more questions, security questions being on, that, uh, on Slack than I did via any other means. So actually having your um, security experts using the same kind of tools as you, I think is a really good way of embedding security into development teams. Unit testing. Um, I, often, I, I don't often see security tests um, done from unit testing. I mean, does anyone even write security unit tests? One person, uh, okay. So developers know how to test their code. Um, they have really good ways of testing their code, so uh, try and test the security stuff as well. So um, let's take a, as an example, uh, here is a unit test for uh, the brute force thing. Uh, again, this isn't, this isn't a great test. It's probably not how you would actually write it, but the concept, right, uh, we have, we've defined the, the type of, uh, we've defined a test for the requirement that we have. So let's say we've done those kind of things. Uh, what kind of issues can we take away 
uh, take out of this report. So yeah, we have a unit test for this, uh, for the uh, M MVC being brute forcible. Cool. We can write a unit test for directory traversal. SQL injection, I mean, that's a really super easy one to, uh, to, to test, um, depending on how your code base is written, obviously. Uh, and I would say, you know, kind of none of these really would be super easy to unit test. Um, but the point is, you know, we've tested some of them already. So that's, that's now tests that the developers don't need to, uh, that the pen testers don't need to look into. Security tooling. I see so many security tools by hackers for hackers. That's so wrong. Hackers need to be writing security tools for developers. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if anyone kind of feels the same way. I remember when I uh, wanted to uh, use, does anyone use Burp, Burp Suite? Yeah, an intercepting proxy. Someone, asked, uh, someone said to me the other day, oh, Burp is really complicated. I was like, nah, it's not, it's super easy. And then I remembered back to when I first started using Burp Suite and how complicated it actually was. Um, these aren't, are not tools that we should expect developers to be using. We need to write tools that will actually integrate into the dev pipeline. So uh, yeah, so anyone here who is writing security tools, think about that. Uh, so this is my quite naive approach. Um, I took a uh, application uh, for mobile, um, or for Android application testing. It's a, a framework called Rosa. And I integrated it with Jenkins. Um, it wasn't a good integration. Uh, I think I just basically wrapped it up in, in some shell scripts and things. Uh, but it was integrated, which meant that every time I, I did a build of the app, I was able to automatically you know, check whether these security vulnerabilities were present, and if not, fail the build. Uh, if they were present, fail the build. So we should be writing tools that, um, that provide feedback to the developers uh, and integrate with, with the build system. And I don't think the InfoSec community really understands this yet. So yeah, basically, as I said, you know, we want a way to build automatically test using the tools that are out there, um, written, but written for, for developer use cases, and then notify the developers. So of the tools that do exist for, for this kind of thing, um, who uses any SaaS tools, so static application security uh, tooling? A few people? OK, cool. So uh, basically, this will scan source code. So you know, imagine you, everything that you've written gets scanned for, for vulnerabilities. Um, uses things like pattern matching and, and taint analysis so that you're, it's able to look at uh, the data going into, uh, into like a function, um, so the, the source and then where that's being used, the sync. And it's able to say, OK, this thing is being sent to the database. It's not being sanitized. But first, maybe this is likely to be vulnerable to, to SQL injection. There are lots of SaaS tools available, um, so I won't talk about them here. But a guy called Nick Jones did, did quite a good, uh, good talk um, at DevSecCon, I think, last year uh, on like, kind of how SaaS tools work and things. So if you're interested, take a look. We have DAS tools, so this is more dynamic stuff. So these are tooling um, that actually uh, runs against the application. Um, this can be slightly harder than static testing because the app needs to be built, it needs to uh, be running, it needs to, you need to fire requests at it. Um, versus, you know, uh, source code scanning, you just kind of scan it. Um, the tools, they do exist, but to be super useful, they need to be aware of the application. So you kind of need to tell it um, what kind of vulnerability to look for. You know, you might need to give it user credentials. You might need to say, you know, don't click on this button because that will delete everything from the database. Uh, Um, so I, kind of another reason why it can be quite difficult is, is we're dealing with this at the moment. Our, um, our DAS tool is off-site. Um, we're trying to run our test applications on it, but the test environment is internal. So we need to open file, uh, firewall rules or have some other kind of thing to allow it to kind of enter the network. So yeah, they can be a bit more difficult to set up, um, but they can be slightly better for design flaws. And then I asked basically DAS with instrumentation. Um, this is the new kid on the block, really. Um, basically, what it'll do is it'll hook the runtime and it'll monitor threats whilst you're uh, firing test cases at it. So arguably a bit more useful than just plain DAST. So you know, I'm going to say if you do this kind of testing, you can get rid of kind of all these high-risk vulnerabilities, you know, most of these uh, medium-risk ones. And I'm going to say things like sensitive information stored in the sandbox. Maybe the tools won't understand what sensitive information it is. Uh, is. Maybe you can train it, um, but out of the box it won't. 
maybe weak authentication would be very difficult for some of these tools to pick up. Um, and then I would say, you know, some of these low ones, version ban and disclosure, for example, that would be quite easy to test for automatically. And so what about the infrastructure side of things? Infrastructure is, you know, uh, infrastructure's code is, is kind of the key to DevOps. Um, this was going to be a bit of a lengthy section, but I don't really think it's, it's needed. Uh, if you're doing infrastructure as code, you can use SAS tools to scan it. You can say, you know, this is, this is our, our config files. Let's compare that to some kind of policy and flag everything that is out, uh, outside of that policy, like anything that deviates from you know, what we want to, as an organization. If you can't move to infrastructure as code, use some of the tools that, that we as hackers use. Again, write wrappers around them. Use things like, like Nmap or Nessus. Um, OK, it's not great. It's not going to be like very DevOps, but it will give you some understanding of the vulnerabilities that are present um, before you go live. So then I'm going to say, OK, so we've had the project managers uh, and uh, thinking about security and the way that they develop their requirements. Um, we've had developers thinking about security. So how about QA testers? Can we get these guys to think about security as well? Uh, how many testers actually tried to automate security tests? I've spoken to a lot of testers about this, and they say security isn't my job. Well, honestly, the way I see it is a security bug is, is a bug, right? Um, doesn't matter whether it's security or not, it's a bug. It kind of falls into the general remit of testing. Uh, I think the issue is that the tooling doesn't really exist to, to look for security testing, a security issue without a lot of background knowledge, which is, uh, which, which is a shame. So we looked at this earlier. So imagine if we have um, a big list of requirements. Actually, it would be fairly easy then to give that to the test team and say, you know, make sure that these things either work or don't work. Um, we can't really do that unless we had the list of, uh, of the requirements. So, OK, back to pen testing. So these are the vulnerabilities that were left over. So I think maybe things that we couldn't automate away. Um, so, yeah, okay, I thought we were automating security. Uh, I don't think we can automate all security. Maybe 70%, now that's a number I just made up. Um, maybe 70% of, of vulns can be found before the pen test. You know, these will be things like cross-site scripting or SQL injection, um, maybe cookie flags not set correctly. Uh, a lot of things that I spend a lot of time re uh, reporting, we can automate away, and, and should be, really. Um, so I would say once we're able to do this, we can actually say that checklist pen tests are OK. Now, that's something that we hate doing as pen testers. We hate to go in knowing that a test is only being done because someone has asked us to do it. Uh, I would say that if you can automate 70% of the stuff away, um, you can probably hire cheaper pen testers, someone who would literally go along and, and manually verify what you've done. And I think that would actually be OK to do. Um, but the point is that, that you get to decide what gets tested. You get to decide the risk of your application. And maybe you say, this is a low risk application. We're happy with 70% of issues being found. Maybe you say, OK, this is a high risk application. We actually want the manual pen test to come in. Um, I would say pen tests are probably needed for some applications. Uh, I don't think we're ever going to get away from uh, completely automating security, at least you know, kind of in the, the near future. So, what I would like to move towards as a pen tester is a kind of continuous red teaming uh, or a kind of bug bounty system where, as a pen tester, I'm constantly looking at the, an organization's applications and reporting back to them with the issues that I find. So this is where you would find those, those weird logic issues or, or even new vulnerabilities, things that have just been released that are not always going to be picked up by the tools or, or are going to be obvious. Um, but this will only really work if you can feed back into the development lifecycle. And this is how I think pen testing can work in an agile environment. You know, having someone come on board and say, OK, do a five-day pen test at some point during development doesn't really work. Having a continuous um, kind of red team actually would, as long as there's a way to feed the, the information of the vulnerabilities back to the developers. Um, or you can do something like this. So you can say, after there's a, a 
you know, a change to a key area, maybe we are just going to do a, a bit of a, a checklist pen test. We're going to say, okay, this thing has changed. Let's just let's check authentication. Let's check uh, injection. Let's check etc. Um, and I think again, I think that is another good way to to, to do pen testing in this kind of environment. We need to be able to capture the results, though. Um, so, what would be great to see is, you know, output from our SAS tools and from our DAS tools, from, from QA testing and red teaming, going into a central database of issues. At the moment, I think that a lot of these tools um, and teams will report in different ways. There have been so many times when I've given a PDF to someone in, uh, in an organization, and then it just kind of disappears. Um, I was speaking to one lady um, where I used to work, well, for a small contract I did, and I said to her, have you seen the last pen test I did? She said no. Um, I think that she had taken over from the person that I had done the test for before, and there was no handover of the, of the pen test issues. So these need to be fed into a central repository, and then the application as it's being built can actually check this, uh, this database and say, okay, you know, we have these high-risk issues, we're going to stop the build, or maybe we won't. We understand now, we understand the risk of application, we can make the decision what happens. Um, we can also do things like re regression testing. Oh, one thing I did forget to mention in the previous slide. Uh, so who's had to read a, a pen test report before? Yeah. I mean, how useful do you find them, really? Kind of useful? Uh, kind of? W wouldn't it be awesome if you actually got a, 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 a test case instead? Like, I mean, that seems to me would make way more sense rather than a, a PDF. Actually, some kind of code that you can run that says, um, says this is the vulnerability and this is, uh, this, is, you know, this is how you can fix it. So when you do fix it, you actually have something that will run um, to, to show you that it's, it's been complete. Uh, so actually, we have 10 minutes left, but I finished a little early. Are there any questions or does anyone want to have a bit of a discussion about some of these things? Yeah, go on. Yeah, so for what kind of um, what kind of thing? Like infrastructure or application, web, mobile? Yeah, so I can speak to you afterwards if you want. Um, but so for like a web app, I, you know, I, I use things like Burp Suite, which is, as I said, an intercepting proxy. I do lots of things manually with it, or I have my own set of tools that will kind of automate the things that I tend to do. Um, there are loads of tools, but again, these tools aren't really written for for developers, they're, they're written for hackers. There's SQL Map, you know, really awesome tool for do, finding SQL injection, um, but it has like quite a horrible, you know, CLI interface and uh, just kind of nasty. Um, I worked at a place where they had this open source uh, tool. I mentioned it before, Droza, um, and it's, it's a really awesome application for, for testing Android apps and. They tried to, to, to sell a pro version of it. Um, wasn't very successful. I, it, what they did is they just threw a GUI on top of it and assumed developers would want, would want to use it like that. And, and they didn't, and no one bought it. So it's open source. If you do, um, if you do mobile stuff, take a look at it, because it is, it will, we'll find a lot of vulnerabilities in your applications. But it needs help, I think, from, from developers and from the DevOps community to turn those tools into things that kind of work for you guys. They work for us, but yeah, I don't think they work for you guys. Cool. That's okay. Anything else? Yeah? Uh, well, so in, in Android, do you mean, in this case? So it can be a hard one. Um, obviously, encryption is the kind of the big thing, but the question is, then where do you put the keys? I've seen lots of times, especially like in thick clients, the data is all encrypted, uh, and saved on disk, but the key is within the application. So you reverse the application, you get the key, um, or it's a key that, that's shared across all, uh, all applications. So there's, it, it's kind of, so that's why you do need to bring in a security expert, I think, in, right at the beginning. Because if they say to you, okay, yeah, encryption, do that, these are the things you need to consider. The key shouldn't be stored uh, here. It needs to, to maybe your, I don't know. I mean, there are lots of different approaches to do it. It really depends on, on the way the application works. Um, 
it might be that storing the key within the app is fine if you you know, have enough obfuscation and you say, we accept that someone might be able to recover this key, but it's gonna take them six months. Maybe you're okay with that, that level of things. Uh, so there is a lot of things to consider. It's, it's very rarely a case of like one answer for like the best way to do it. It depends on a lot of things. Um, so I've, I've seen also before things like, uh, like uh, tokens stored inside applications. Um, and this is one that actually get, I get asked a lot, you know, how, what do we do with these tokens if we don't want to store it in the application? Um, the, the best answer I can usually give is to, uh, so rather than storing the app in the, the token in the application, use a web service, and that web service has the token which then is used for whatever service it needs to contact. And then you can have your own like, authentication methods on, on that web service. Um, but yeah, I, I've only ever seen one, one person do that properly. Everyone else just kind of hard codes everything. So again, it, it, did everyone hear the question? Because I, I, I like the question. So basically, what, what's the best use of, I guess, the consultant's time, right? Um, so finding all the low-hanging fruit is definitely a good thing to do because they're the kind of things that will get picked up by tooling. They're the kind of things that an attacker will see and be like, okay, they've done these things wrong. There are, there are gonna be other issues. Um, yeah, like, like everything, I think it depends. You know, if it's a, if it's a particularly high-risk application, you probably want to spend a bit more time looking for the really complex stuff. But that doesn't really make sense to do that unless you've done the, 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 kind of the low-hanging fruit, which is why we need to work out ways to automate things more so that that isn't there. So when I do come in to do a pen test, I'm not spending my time looking for the low-hanging fruit. Because if I'm only on the test for you know, five days um, and I spend those five days doing cross-site scripting, SQL injection, banners shown. I mean, it's not, it's not a, a useful way to, to, to do the pen test. Instead, it should be five days of me pulling my hair out trying to, to find something awesome. Um, and if I'm not doing that, yeah, I would probably say you don't even bother with the pen test at that point. You need to kind of step back and think of other ways to, to start to secure applications. Oh, good question. So I would love to see, um, I guess, just more communication. Uh, I think a lot of the time, you know, this InfoSec community kind of looks down on developers. Uh, the developers kind of look down on InfoSec, um, which makes no sense. When I'm on site, I, I really think of myself as being part of the team for that week or two that I'm there. I'm not there to, to humiliate anyone. I'm there to be the security part of their project because I know I'm a terrible developer. So I shouldn't expect developers to be experts in security. And instead, you know, what I need to do is find a way to impart my knowledge in a way that they can use without being experts themselves. And so I think just like communication between, between everyone is, is, and that's the point of DevOps, right? It's, it's about communication. So I did this whole talk, and I didn't even mention DevSecOps, which I was quite, uh, quite pleased with. Because um, I don't want this to be like a DevSecOps thing. This is, is security in development. Um, it's part of DevOps. It's about bringing everything together, as was mentioned in the talk earlier. Anything else? I think we still have uh, some time. We've got time for one more question. Okay, cool. No, nothing? Okay, thanks very much.